Back in 2008, the anticipated sequel to the first Mercenaries game launched to fairly miserable reviews. IGN gave the game a 3.9, citing the terrible gameplay, the baffling enemy AI, and several game-breaking bugs. I remember seeing that review when I first played the game myself, somewhere around 2010 or 2011. And I also remember the game being a great time, in spite of, yeah, some pretty serious bugs. A while back, I remembered seeing that review and it got me thinking about whether my my memories of the game were accurate. A later review from IGN would update the score to a 7.9, and some other posts I found recalled the game pretty fondly. So it seems like time has been kind to the game. But was it actually any good? Wanting to answer that very question, I played through all of Mercenaries 2 16 years after its launch. So let's dive right in. The game takes place in a fictionalized version of Venezuela, where the mercenary of your choice is hired by wealthy business tycoon Solano to rescue a friend of his who's been kidnapped. I'm sure Solano has a first name, but I can't for the life of me remember what it is, and you'll never hear it again after the start of the game. For this playthrough, I chose to play as the face character of the entire series and walking Swedish stereotype Matthias Nilsson. He's living proof of why the army limits the number of times a soldier can fire heavy weapons each day, and some of his endearingly dumb quotes have stuck with me ever since that first playthrough years ago. The rescue mission serves as a decent tutorial for the game's mechanics, and once General Carmona is rescued, the plot kicks off proper when and Matias is betrayed and gets shot in the tender bits while escaping. Carmona and Solano stage a coup to seize control of Venezuela, while Matias swears revenge on the two of them and anyone else who gets in his way. The first thing that stuck out to me on this playthrough is something I wouldn't have picked up on my first time around. Namely, that it feels a lot like a GTA clone. In reality, Mercenaries 2 is much more another entry in the sandbox style that GTA helped create, rather than a proper clone, so you can explore the map freely between between missions, and all of your commuting is usually done in a stolen car. There aren't any police in the game, which means that most of your crimes don't have any consequences, though the different factions in the game will attack you if you spend too much time in a vehicle belonging to a faction they're fighting. In a bit of an odd touch, honking the horn does reset the timer for the disguise, so you may find yourself cruising through the game's two cities, laying on the horn so your allies don't shoot you by accident. Overall, most of the vehicles handle pretty well, which is fortunate given how much ground you have to cover in the course of the game. The big exception for me are the tanks. For some reason I could never get the hang of how they handle, which meant I spend a lot of time crashing into things, rather than doing any of the other things you'd need a tank for. Of course you can't have a game like this without hordes of enemies to challenge you. Enemies on foot are rarely a threat. They die very quickly to most of the guns and go down in one melee attack, though you are always outnumbered. Snipers and rocket infantry, on the other hand, buck that trend by both being very damaging. The sniper rifles in the game are fairly inaccurate, but every explosive in the game has an enormous hitbox and it does a ton of damage. By the end of my time in the game, I had learned to prioritize any enemy with a rocket launcher just so I wouldn't constantly be losing chunks of my health because someone in my zip code fired a shot in my general direction. Aside from infantry, enemies can also send vehicles after you. Light vehicles like jeeps with machine guns are a dime a dozen at every point in the game, and fortunately they don't do too much damage, as long as you're not just holding still where they can see you. Enemy boats are in a similar space, because they aren't much of a threat outside of certain niche scenarios. For as much of the map of this region is covered in water, Lake Maracaibo is a fairly prominent feature in the game, you really don't spend a ton of time on the water, so boats can't really get at you. The real issue with the vehicles are enemy tanks, turrets, and helicopters. Just about every one of them is equipped with at least one explosive weapon, and they're always faster on the trigger and more accurate than you. For most of the game, any tank duel that you try to get involved with is going to end with you being shot twice before you can even turn around, at which point you're forcibly ejected from the vehicle because it just exploded. In a lot of ways it does remind me of the month or so I spent playing World of Tanks, so if you liked the combat in that game, maybe you'll have an easier time than I did. So if vehicle on vehicle combat is rarely a good idea, what are your options? Rocket weapons do good damage, though they are the guns that have by far the worst accuracy. But who needs guns when you have the strongest thing in the game? Just madly sprinting up to the things. You can hijack every vehicle in the game so long as the gunner seat is empty. Each hijacking attempt requires a short, quick time event, which I'll admit is one thing I'm glad to see we've mostly moved away from. Having to play 10 seconds of a Mario Party minigame just to do something does get really tedious very quickly. The length and difficulty of the button presses depends on the relative strength of the vehicle that you're hijacking. 
attacking, with late game ones that are much stronger needing much tighter timing and different inputs than earlier ones. Though it'll never change based on the vehicle type, so you'll memorize them all pretty quickly. Assuming you pass all the inputs you need, you eject the driver from the vehicle and take control of it. If you fail, you take a huge chunk of damage, but usually there's nothing stopping you from trying again right away. And you definitely will fail, at least occasionally. There seems to be some kind of randomness coded in that can cause some attempts to suddenly become impossible at the last minute. You're also invincible during the QTE, which combined with the fact that your health regenerates after a few seconds of not taking damage, makes hijacking my favorite way to heal in the middle of a tough fight. You can also just hide behind some cover or pick up the health packs that enemies drop occasionally, but enemies will rush you if you try, so it can be a bit risky. Now if the game were just a late 2000s style sandbox with tricky vehicle combat, I doubt it would have stuck with me for so long. No, the biggest draw, and by far my favorite part of the game, is the airstrikes. You can find them scattered throughout the world or buy them from the shops, and whenever you want to call one down you just need to throw the smoke grenade or the radio beacon, or maybe shine the laser pointer and watch your problem disappear. And probably take a few steps back, because as I said earlier, explosion damage has a much wider radius than you think it does. Besides an egregious amount of heavy ordnance, you can also call in supply drops and vehicles, which can be really handy when you're preparing for a big fight. You can also call in allies on certain missions, but you really won't until you absolutely have to, because the AI is special. If you're anything like me, you're probably wondering why you wouldn't just carpet bomb every mission forever and leave the vehicles and guns alone. There are two limiting factors to when you can call the strikes in. The fuel cost and the presence of enemy countermeasures. Fuel can be found all over the world, though you need to extract it by having your pet helicopter pilot pick it up. It's not too bad at the start of the game, but it can be pretty tedious when you have to stop and grind up a lot in the late game. The countermeasures are the real problem out of the two. After a certain point in the story, your enemy will start having anti-air guns and jammers that you need to deal with before you can call anything in. They are worth dealing with so you can do the thing that you came here for, but the back half of the game does tend to spam them on every mission. I'm sure the developers felt not having them would make things too easy, but this really is just one of my few complaints about the game. The main source of these airstrikes and vehicles are the game's factions. There are five factions you can work for in the game, representing different interests in the conflict that Solano started. The first two you meet are are Universal Petroleum, an American oil company that's in the country for obvious reasons, and the People's Liberation Army of Venezuela, a communist guerrilla movement that wants all foreign parties out of the country. After you do enough missions that the conflict escalates past what anybody wanted, two new factions get added to the mix. The Allied Nations, an obvious stand-in for the UN that's just the CIA and Groucho Marx classes, and China, who apparently didn't rate getting a stand-in in the writer's eyes. Both are here for the oil, because this game isn't subtle or clever, but honestly, none of that matters. I can't imagine the story being any the thing that anyone goes to the Mercenaries games for. There's also the Jamaican pirates, who are just happy to be here. Wikipedia tells me they're actually based on a possibly real Jamaican organized crime group, but I haven't done enough research to really comment on that. Each of these factions gives you several missions to reclaim outposts, which each give you a new shop and new fast travel points, in addition to dozens of optional challenges and side activities. The more of these you do, the more of each faction's arsenal you have access to, and there are some real differences between each faction's vehicles and gear, so it's worth doing. Just as an example, the AN's assault rifle has great damage and accuracy, which makes it my favorite weapon for most of the game after you get it, while the Chinese fuel air RPG is actually broken. The Chinese heavy tank is also the one vehicle where the combat really clicks for me, so it's a shame the game is practically over by the time you get it. And that more or less covers the gameplay. Mercenaries 2 is a game where you play a nigh unstoppable force of nature through a story that is so dumb it's a good thing it never really takes itself seriously. If that thing sounds like your thing, I think you'd have a great time with a game that I feel is an underrated gem, if you can find it. Recording the footage for this review was more of an ordeal than I could have predicted. Mercenaries 2 was ever only released for the 7th gen consoles and PC through Origin. 
Origin. I wasn't lucky enough to buy it on Origin over a decade ago, and it's not available anymore if you didn't do that, which meant I had to hope that my Xbox 360 that I bought off a friend in 2011 and the capture card I had hanging around from a previous failed YouTube channel about nine years ago both still work. Unfortunately, my 360 got the Red Ring of Death, which meant I had to buy a used one from a local retro game store. Once I got that sorted out, and oh boy did that take a lot of sorting, it turns out that the capture card I had won't work on anything more advanced than Windows 8. Uh, with no other options left, I did finally catch a lucky break. The game is basically abandonware at this point, and it's easy enough to find it online if you know where to look. So if you've been wondering where all the water went in this video, it isn't because all the boats got replaced with magical floating skyships. If I take nothing else away from this, this whole process really stressed the need for game preservation to me. I shouldn't have had to jump through this many hoops just to play by what all accounts was a fairly successful game from the same studio that brought us Star Wars Battlefront. I, while I may not always like the never-ending parade of remakes and remasters we currently have, they do go a long way towards making sure that games are still able to be enjoyed years after they came out. Basically, if EA ever wants to make a lot of money for not that much effort, just remaster Mercenaries 2. Or give it a proper remake, I'm sure there's a lot that they could improve on. In absence of said remaster or remake, what are the options for someone who still wants to call down an irresponsible amount of explosives on anything that so much as looks at them funny? Is there perhaps a spiritual successor out there that takes some of the best ideas from the game and puts a modern spin on them? Maybe one with even more creativity and a heavy dose of Paul Verhoeven style irony. Helldivers 2 is a game that exploded onto the scene in early 2024 and perfectly captures the feeling that kept Mercenaries 2 fondly in my memory for so many years. The easiest way to sum the game up is that it's what you'd get if you threw Warhammer 40k and Starship Troopers into a blender. You play as a Helldiver, a kind of space marine that gets dropped onto planets that are being overrun by alien bugs or alien robots with a series of objectives to complete and free reign to use however much ordinance you need to to get it done. While it trades Mercenary 2's sandbox for a more of a horde shooter structure, the stratagem system feels like it was heavily inspired by Mercenaries 2, though the developers did improve on it in one big way. Rather than needing to manage your inventory and fuel budgets, stratagems are on a cooldown timer that means you can use them several times a mission. The variety of airstrikes you have access to is also a lot more varied due to the game's sci-fi setting. It's a blast, honestly, especially if you can get some buddies to play with, and it's a great way to scratch that same mercenaries itch without having to worry about whether or not your nearly 20-year-old system still works. But what if you wanted something like Mercenaries 2 that was more tailored to a single-player experience? To my knowledge, there really isn't another game that fits the same niche, Though, if there is one I just haven't heard of, feel free to leave a comment down below. I'd love to check it out. If you'll allow me, though, to switch hats like I occasionally do in these videos and indulge my inner game designer, what would a true single-player spiritual successor to Mercenaries look like? We'd need to call in airstrikes, which limits the setting somewhat. And personally, I think a modern-day setting actually limits what those airstrikes can be quite a bit. So with that in mind, if I were making this game, I'd probably go with a fantasy setting. Having magic as an option really opens up some opportunities to go wild with what is our main gameplay loop. The faction system is one of Mercenary 2's biggest strengths, so I'd keep that and maybe flesh it out even more. I'm imagining something like a small kingdom or a region of barely settled wilderness for the location. Somewhere where having several factions vying for control could allow the player's choices on who to support when really have a tangible impact. Just to spitball here, maybe the first two factions could be something like a local lord and the band that live nearby. Having a small-scale conflict between the two would allow the player the chance to get a feel for the world and the game systems in a relatively low-stakes environment before any of the major players get involved. At the height of that particular conflict, so kind of the end of the first act, the player would stumble across something that would get the attention of those major powers. I'm personally a fan of ancient super weapons in a story like this, but I do recognize that's a fairly trite plot point these days, and there's almost certainly something more interesting that could go there. 
Once the new factions are available, I'd give the player a couple missions with each to give them a chance to learn about them before they really have to consider which ones to support. One of the big things I feel is missing from Mercenaries 2 is real consequences to your choices of which factions to support, since the most that ever comes from it is that Solano nukes whichever major faction you go with. Having those choices impact the world, even if it's just something as simple as having the factions fight over an outpost, would go a long way towards building the player's investment in the story. As for the final segment of the story, say Act 3, that's really open depending on the details of what came before. If you put me on the spot, I'd lean towards something kind of like the Battle of Kaer Morhen from The Witcher 3, where the player can call in support from the factions they've sided with to help fight a new, larger threat. That could even double as a reward for players who manage to balance everything out, kind of like the independent Vegas route from the best Fallout game. Honestly, none of this speculation is really necessary. I, I do think somebody could make a game that played just like Mercenaries 2 without paying much attention to the plot or the factions, and have it be a tremendously fun time. That being said, I do think that if you put in that kind of effort to really make the factions more interesting, it'd make the game something truly special. With one last change of hats, where does this leave us? I came into this wondering if a game that I played when I was younger was actually as good as I remembered, and honestly, I was surprised at how well it held up in a lot of ways. Mercenaries 2 being forgotten by the general gaming public is a real shame, and it's prime material for a remake or remaster. I have no idea if anything like that could happen, but I sincerely hope it does. We may have some options to fill the void in the meantime, but how many other games let you drop a bunker buster on its most annoying faction? What else do I even need to say? Anyway, that's all the time we have for today. I'll have a poll going up soon to vote on the order for the next few videos, so be sure to keep an eye out for that. And as always, thank you again for watching to the end of the video. I hope you had as much fun with this one as I did, and I'll catch you in the next one.